My name is Kevin Love. I'm a senior lecturer in philosophy and social theory at Nottingham Trent University. I want to pick two words from that title, the first of which being universal, the universal relational milieu in which we and objects reside. We occupy the same world. We are in a form of relation. What is important, though, is what type of relation, what mode of relationality we find ourselves in. Typically, in, in science and philosophy at least, uh, we have envisaged this mode of relation as, as a way of seeing the world, uh, a theoretical knowing of the world. And the, the very term theory derives from the Greek theoria, which is itself related to sight and vision. So it's quite a, an active way of, of uh, our pursuing the world through the motif or metaphor of sight. Now, sight, as we know, is a very particular mode of engagement with the world. It's as though we, we stare out at the world from behind the, the glass panes of our windows, that we survey, that we observe, that we are not necessarily particularly involved with the world. This is problematic for a whole host of reasons. In more contemporary philosophy, uh, different metaphors, different privileged ways of, of understanding this universal milieu have emerged. I'm thinking here in particular of uh, Meule Pontier, 20th century French phenomenologist, who develops a fascinating concept called flesh of the world. It's the idea that we are embodied incarnate, carnal, just as much as other objects, other things within the world, are also fleshy, incarnate, and embodied. And the privileged mode for understanding relationality in this form therefore becomes that of the touch. It's not primarily thinking of our relationship in terms of a, a removed viewing or observing, but rather that we are involved, we are touching, and that every touching is also a touched. This irredeemable duality in touching, this, this neither active entirely nor passive entirely, touching touched, gives us a different way for configuring that universal relationality, that milieu, in which we and other objects reside. So then we come to our second term, the address, addressability. How is it that we are able to address objects and how is it that objects are able to address us? What is that form, that particular mode of involvement and engagement? And for the purposes of, of, of this moment in the talk, I'd like to draw your attention to these three faces here. Now, indeed, what is more touching for us than the face? What touches us more in its expression, in its, its uh, call to us, than the face? The face is that, perhaps, which is most direct, most ad directum or ad dressing uh, toward us. Here we, we see three very different faces, but we see them all eye to eye, as it were, face to face. But again, in, in recent philosophy, the very directness of the address begins to be called into question. I mean, first of all, let us say, with quick allusion to Magritte, that this is not a face. These, these two dots and uh, a dash, these are just symbolic readings of something deeper, some material or, or um, some object that eludes any kind of symbolism of the face, perhaps the most overdetermined symbol of all. So how are we to direct ourselves to that which resides below or underneath the symbolism, the ideal, the, the moment of the, of the symbolic face? What are they below that? Are they mere matter? Are they some kind of object that perpetually withdraws? These are the kinds of questions that are beginning to configure themselves in uh, 21st century continental thought. For me, the way that we can begin to configure what resides below or between these faces is by perhaps addressing uh, the thought of Emmanuel Levinas in the first instance. He has a concept of the ilia, which is this almost a formless materiality he talks about a buzzing, a grumbling, a muttering, something that's continuing below the surface of the meaningful, below the surface of the symbolic, 
but something that we don't quite approach, we can never quite grasp or comprehend. Similarly, for Graham Harmon, we have a notion of a withdrawn object, an object that will give itself to us in particular perspectives, in particular accidental or even essential qualities, but itself, again, continually withdraws from our, from our touch, from our reach, and certainly from our gaze. Finally, the uh, way that we can think about this withdrawal is to think about the difference between. Rather than thinking of the object as anything in itself, we can think simply about the context that different objects, different images create in and between themselves. And this mode of thinking the difference is a further way of addressing the indirectness of objects. So I've been talking about modes of relationality generally and how we might configure that universal relational milieu in which we reside with other objects and other people. This though typically is in philosophy what we call an ontological position. Ontology being concerned with questions of being, with what is and with how those things that are relate to one another. For me um, the question that concerns art more specifically is, is a slightly different question. And the way in which we relate to artistic objects is not necessarily first and foremost ontological, nor need it be derived directly from the ontological. There's a number of interesting moments in, um, in philosophical thought where the question of aesthetics, as it's often posed, where the question of aesthetics is raised. One in particular that, that springs to mind is Adorno's notion in aesthetics theory of the uh, work of art as that which, ex which exceeds any kind of social utility whatsoever. It's not necessarily that, that we can value art or that we exhaust the work of art in valuing it or that we can commodify it or that we can utilize it politically or in some other way in which it, it operates for us in a utilitarian mode. Rather, art or the event of art is that moment which precisely exceeds the entire social value of commodities, the entire social value or political value of item. Adorno, to try and capture this moment, talks about the idea of the shudder, that the event of art is typified by a, a visceral reaction, by a shudder that um, strikes us, if you will, in the very core of our being or our soul. The shudder is, is not us placing art, but the art placing us, the art putting us, if you will, in the subject position. One of the ways then that we can try to think about art is as a specific modality of difference. When we talked earlier about touchings and being touched by things, um, in one sense that is true, we do get hold of objects in the world. But in another way, our touchings never quite touch. We never quite uh, make that, that, that leap. We never quite bridge that divide between ourselves and others or between ourselves and objects. What is important, though, again, is to think about the particular modality of the difference that occupies that gap. It may be one thing in ethics, or ways of, of trying to relate to other, each other ethically. It may be another in politics. In relation to art, how does that difference between ourselves and the objects resonate? How is it that objects are able to appeal to us in a specifically artistic sense? What is the process of the formation of the relation? And what is it that artworks achieve and accomplish in that? Again, this is not an entirely active moment on the part of ourselves, the viewer, nor is it an entirely passive moment on the part of the object. The key, I think, is to understand it in a middle-voiced mode, to understand the difference, the resonance between the two.